Hello, reptile entrepreneurs. I am here with Dylan Perrin of the Animals at Home Network. Dylan, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Bill. Always excited to chat with you. Yeah, well, uh, I hear there's some news in your uh, in your life. Uh, you are now uh, officially a network. That's right. Yes, officially a network. And actually, just as of this morning, I'm not sure when people will be listening to this episode right now, but I did release an, an another show underneath the network. That's the Reptiles and Research podcast is now added underneath the umbrella of the Animals at Home Network. So I'm super excited. And I think there'll be another one later this summer. I won't say anything about it yet. It's still uh, under wraps, but it's an, an, another exciting show as well. Maybe we should explain. What is a podcast network? Well, I guess I'm going to just give my own definition of what a podcast network is because I, I've kind of created my own thing. I, originally, I started Animals at Home as a podcast, and which was fantastic. I did that for maybe 40 or 50 episodes, but I quickly realized that I, I couldn't keep up with the amount of content that I wanted to produce. And so I thought it'd be great to have other people hosting shows underneath the same banner. And I originally got the idea from years ago, there was a podcast called the Herp, Herp Nation Radio, for those that, that may remember that. And they had, it was under one, you would subscribe to Herp Nation Radio on your podcasting app or platform. And then there would just be several different hosts and they had their own shows. And I, I thought that worked really well. I liked it because you could choose sort of what type of episode you want to listen to, what host you, you were listening to. So I sort of wanted to emulate that. And so that's why I brought Bryce Broom on from uh, Animals Everywhere podcast. He's underneath my network, and now I've added Liam and Ellie for the Reptiles and Research podcast. So basically, if you go to Spotify or Apple and just search Animals at Home Network, you're going to get one show, and all of our episodes will be underneath it. So you just subscribe once, and then it's all there for you. Now, they do post their podcasts on YouTube as well, and I let them handle that and do due to their own channels. That's nothing to do with me, but the audio comes underneath Animals at Home Network. So it's all sort of consolidated in one spot. And so what do you do personally to uh, to support this? So I handle all the uploads to the audio or to the podcast repository or the directory. So they send me the files. I make sure they have show notes up on my website, links to whatever they were talking about in the podcast. Uh, I pay for the, the server hosting fees. As you know, you, it's not free to host a podcast, and maybe that's something we could talk about later, but you do, yeah, yeah. you do have to pay some bills to host a podcast, so I cover all of that as well. So I basically cover the execution of getting it out to people's ears, not to mention the podcast is already has quite a large subscribership, so when someone adds a show underneath the network, they're sort of piggybacking off of that subscribership as well. So we'll, 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 we'll go ahead and get into your particular situation, uh, and there's a reason why you are the one that I requested for this, uh, this topic of uh, con comparing and contrasting podcasting and YouTube. It's that you have done both and not just, uh, oh, okay, I'm going to do a little bit here, a little bit there, but you've really dived in. And so you have a uh, unique and uh, qualified perspective on this topic. Uh, talk to the audience and tell them exactly what animals at home the show is and uh, with relation to podcasting and YouTubing. Okay, so uh, P Animals at Home podcast is a podcast that I host and it's mainly discussing reptile husbandry or just in general herpetoculture. The main focus of the show is pushing herpetoculture forward and trying to come up with more ethical ways to do things, whether that's breeding and keeping. And so we look at lots of natural history and bring in people who are amazing breeders or expert researchers and biologists and whatnot. So it really does cover the whole gamut. Sometimes I do step outside the reptile world as well, but typically it's within the reptile world. Now I host the show. It's an audio, it's an, it's a podcast. So it's a conversation between myself and a guest typically ranging from 60 minutes to 90 minutes typically. And it is a conversation that you can hear on any of the podcasting platforms. So it, it was originally meant to be an audio only sort of medium and people would listen to the conversation and, and, and that was it. But I also, when I first started publishing it, I also decided that I would just publish the video version on my YouTube channel. At the time, my YouTube channel was mainly just sort of DIY projects, sort of small things that I was doing in my reptile room. And I thought, well, I'll just continue to post the podcast there as well, because when you record a podcast on Zoom, you get the video f file as well, you know, as long as you have the permission of the guest that was being uploaded to my channel. And so both of those were happening sort of simultaneously. When I would record a podcast, I'd upload it on the audio side, and then I would also upload it on the video side. And over time, the video side started to get more and more popular uh, to the point where it's 
way more popular than just the audio only listeners. I still have quite a few audio only listeners, but I'm just amazed at how many people are watching the full length podcast on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so now I've started to try to cater to that a little bit by adding a few more visual elements that you don't necessarily miss if you're just listening to it. You don't necessarily know that there's a picture of a snake on the screen, for example. But if you're sitting on your computer or watching on your phone, it gives you a little more visual interaction. So, so that is sort of the premise of what I'm working with right now. What was your decision-making process in the beginning as to whether, why did you start a podcast instead of a YouTube channel? Well, I was doing the YouTube channel and I, I quickly realized that I felt unqualified to talk about anything because I was kind of right. new to the hobby. I wasn't, I had maybe been keeping reptiles for seven or eight years, but I had very little experience. And I just, you know, I started recording these care videos. It's sort of classic pet tube stuff. And I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> this feels so unauthentic to me. It, did, it felt like I was regurgitating information that I was finding online and I just it just mm -hmm. didn't sit, fit, sit right with me so then I had the epiphany that I should have other people come on my my channel and talk for me and that was the beginning of the podcast I thought if I if I brought experts on then I could ask questions and instead of the YouTube channel being a place for me to give information to people it was actually a place for me to learn information and then for my audience to actively watch me go through that learning process. And, and that's kind of what it has been from, from that point on. It's me bringing experts on and picking their brains and asking questions. And the audience gets to go on that journey with me. And it feels way more comfortable for me because I feel like I'm not trying to come up with facts and information for the audience. I'm really just letting my curiosity sort of run the show. So why didn't you just do that on your YouTube channel? Uh, why start a podcast to do that? I think it was just because I was a big fan of podcasts. I, I love podcasts. I listened to, like I said, Herp Nation Radio I loved, but I also listened to many other podcasts, you know, true crime, um, financial podcasts, everything. I have, there's always a podcast playing in my car. And even, I started the podcast in 2018. So even in 2018, I felt like podcasts were still kind of new. I mean, they still are sort of a new thing, a new phenomenon as well, but they hadn't really taken off yet. I mean, if you look at podcasts now, it's incredible how many, you know, the production value of some of these shows has gone oh, through yeah. the roof. But oh, yeah. it, it, especially you have some of those big networks that are producing shows and they're just amazing to listen to. And so I think I was just a podcast fan and I liked the format and I, I'm someone that spent a lot of time either working out or in my car. And, you know, you can only listen to so much music and commercials before you go, I kind of want something else. And uh -huh. that's what's great about that found time of being able to either listen to audiobooks or podcasts is... I just liked it, so that's why I went for it. Well, let's uh, let's start at the beginning, and people are our listeners and viewers are trying to decide. Here's our scenario: they're trying to decide whether uh, they should go with a podcast or a YouTube channel, and so let's let's just start at the beginning. What is a podcast, and then what is a YouTube channel? So a podcast is. Essentially, I would sort of liken it to the sort of talk AM radio. You know, it's it's not, I shouldn't compare it to that because it's not that boring in some sense. <laughs> I think AM radio has a bad rap, but it, it is very much that. It is two people talking or, or one host talking through a concept and, and sometimes it's conversational, sometimes it's more structured, like interview style. But the thing that pretty much separates podcasts from other things is their long form format. Now, not all podcasts are long form because you can find sort of short, sweet podcasts that are four or five minutes. But I would say on average, most podcasts are going to be between 30 minutes and 90 minutes. And they are just a place for people to flesh out ideas in a more typically more casual and thorough sense than something that has to be short and sweet, like a 10 minute video. Dylan, what do you do as far as your YouTube uh, videos? I, I almost see my YouTube channel is two separate things. There's most of the videos on my YouTube channel are the podcast. So it's just the video version of the podcast. And like you said, I don't necessarily count that as a YouTube video. It is a video on YouTube, but it's not the conventional YouTube video. And once in a while I do other videos as well. That might be, you know, an update in my animal room. And, and later this summer, there's going to be a lot of updates happening in here. So I am going to do a series of proper videos where I'm, you know, more of that vlog style where you're taking people through a project. So that is one concept of YouTube that I sprinkle into my YouTube channel. But most of my channel is the long form, essentially just the video recording of the podcast that I posted on either Spotify or Apple. Okay. So we have uh, the podcast, which is audio only, and then YouTube, which is the video, which includes audio. 
Uh, what do you notice as the difference between the audience between podcast and video? The biggest thing is I think because podcasts are in their infancy, even though they've been around for 10 or 15 years, it is still so new compared to the rest of these formats. You know, so the point that I'm getting to is it's very difficult to know who your podcast audience is. You know, you get these rough analytics. You can, for those of you that have a podcast, you know, you'll log into your directory wherever you upload your podcast. You'll get your download numbers and all that. But there are very few places for a podcast listener to interact with the show. And what I mean by that is if you watch a video on YouTube that you really love, you go down to the comments, you type a comment, and then you interact with the creator. Where with the podcast, you have Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, whatever platform you use, you listen to it, but that's it. There's no way to connect immediately with the creator. Now, if you want to connect with the creator, you can. You can do that through email or Instagram, and that's where most of mine come from. But I guess the long story, the, the long story short to this question is, it's hard to know who that audience is of the podcast listeners. Now, I think a lot of my audience floats between both mediums, and we can talk about why that is maybe a little bit later, but it, um, I would say if people who are strictly listening to the podcast are people who are in their car, the people that are very serious about the show because they're going to, they listen to it start to finish. You know, they hit, as soon as they hit play, they're not messing with their phone or they're going for a run. So I would say the people who are actually listening to the audio are probably the most thorough listeners. Now, that doesn't mean they don't, don't jump over to the video as well, but I would say they get through the whole content. We're on YouTube. You know, you get a bit of everything. If YouTube starts promoting one of the podcast episodes, you might get 12 year olds who are interested in animals that have the attention span of, you know, four or five minutes and mm -hmm. then they're gone type thing. Yeah. So it's, it's, I would say the quality of the listenership on the podcast side is much higher, but again, who are they? We don't know. <laughs> yeah. So when you started off with your podcast and then you just were throwing things on YouTube, how did you notice the growth of both of those? I would say the growth was very slow. The, the, there were a few videos of mine that were shorter videos that had, you know, like sterilizing wood. Like I have a video on YouTube <laughs> where, where, you know, how to clean your, your wood yeah. for your vivariums or your terrariums. That video sort of took off, and I think it was just a well-keyworded choice. You know, people search that all the time. and Yeah, the last so time I were, checked, it was 90,000 views Yeah, for sterilizing wood. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So take it or leave it or whatever it is. I'm not sure why that is. It's just how, how it goes. But so some of the videos kind of went. But the podcast was more popular on the audio version at first. And, and the, the videos that I was posting on YouTube were, they did pretty poorly. I mean, they might get like 80 or 100 views or even less, you know, 20, 30 views because they're such long videos. And I had no, you know, listenership wasn't really there yet. So there wasn't really a spike in growth. And I, I really didn't get a spike in growth until this calendar year, 20, the, the winter of 2022, is when I first started seeing, you know, a sort of more of an exponential growth. Before that, it was all very linear, you know, trucking along. It was growing, but just like this steady sort of diesel engine style, truck, mm -hmm. truck, truck, mm -hmm. slowly growing. When I was going through that time of, you know, very little growth, I just kept telling myself, consistency 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 just keep producing the show don't even i didn't really look at the numbers because i didn't want to dep depress myself or get sad it's just <laughs> you know just keep making the show and eventually it's going to pay off but you have to do that for so long that you sort of have to be crazy to continue doing it because you know yeah. there's no evidence of it working for a very long yes. time but it did pay off so that's my message to people is like consistency is such an important factor in this do you have any idea what caused that sudden growth on youtube not really, <laughs> which is sort of the sad thing. I, I, I suspect that you, YouTube might have made an algorithm change in how they start promoting videos. I mean, the one thing that is so powerful about YouTube is the algorithm. It is, as the years go on, it gets better and better at connecting the viewer with the video that they want to see. And that's what keeps people on the flat platform is constantly seeing thumbnails and videos of things that you might want to watch. I mean, we've all got stuck into that YouTube black hole where you can't get mm -hmm. off because it's like damn this is another video i want to watch <laughs> uh -huh. but that 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 has the system has to learn how to do that and so either there was a change in the algorithm that had more weight towards longer form videos and youtube was more comfortable showing you know a 90 minute video on someone's home screen where maybe it wasn't before or suddenly something clicked with the algorithm and then it went oh i understand the type of viewer who wants to see animals at home and 
so one of those two happens both of them will be algorithm related and then suddenly a bunch of my episodes started getting pumped up more than i ever have sort of a hockey stick shaped graphs you know videos that were dead you know maybe getting one or two video views a day to getting a thousand views a day or 1500 views a day really random and and videos you know one video right now one podcast episode that i did i think published in 2020 the summer of 2020 suddenly in the last two days a thousand views on it and so i think i don't know what's going on there but youtube has decided to put it in front of the people that want to watch it and that helps we are a, a lot of us are familiar with how YouTube works, and we have the algorithm, and uh, you have material served up to you, and so uh, we, we know how we find uh, programs there. But podcasts, those are it, it's very strange at how long podcasts have been around, but it still seems to be a bit of a niche, and, mm-hmm. and it's it's huge, it's exploded, but it still doesn't feel like it's hit the mainstream. How do people find podcasts uh, to listen to? Well, that, that's a really good point. I mean, the, the way to find them is by downloading one of the platforms, Spotify or Apple. I prefer Spotify. But you are correct in saying that it seems like it's very much in the infancy. A, you'll still talk to people who have never heard of what a podcast is, which is mm-hmm. pretty fascinating. But B, and the big one is that none of these big tech companies have, have r- taken podcasts and run with them and created an application that functions well for that medium. And it becomes this, like I said earlier, there's no way to interact with the creator. There's very little algorithm that's helping people find episodes that they want. Like if you are interested in a podcast, you got to go to a podcast app and search reptiles or specifically search Chameleon Academy or Animals at Home. And if you don't do that, you are never going to find our shows because it's just in a sea of sort of un un not not necessarily uncategorized, but there's just so much content on there and it, it's not coming to your screen as easily as something like YouTube. So I, I predict that eventually in the future, you know, these, these podcasting apps will be get much better at that and they're going to start sh- using an algorithm to show people, you know, shows that they might want. But if anyone is l- interested right now in listening to a podcast, then, I mean, first just Google the podcast you might be interested in. But for me, I... I think Spotify is the best platform right now for podcasts. It just it does the best job on displaying the pod, the episodes, and it, it has a pretty nice search feature. And I just I just think it's better than Apple, and it allows you as a creator allows you to share it directly to Instagram. Like there are things that they've integrated into that platform that other platforms have not done yet, and they are behind. So use Apple or Spotify or any other app, and just search the episode you're looking for, or search the creator's name, and hopefully it will pop up. But like I said, I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see a big boom in, in just the ability for applications to connect people and listeners with the shows they might want to listen to. Yeah, I think one of the problems with the industry is nobody's figured out how to make a whole lot of money with podcasts. It's yeah. it's had its roots in being grassroots and free, and Apple pretty much carried the whole podcast medium uh, just because they liked it. And there wasn't a whole lot of money coming into them from it. So there wasn't this this push or any reason to develop it. Uh, so they just kept it going. And I, I think Spotify has tried to start monetizing it to where it get bring in some serious money. And so as soon as there's money in podcasting, I think we'll see it grow. But until then, uh, people are just going to be figuring out what to do with podcasting, but it's, it's been an incredibly powerful platform uh, for us as creators, uh, but, it, but it's still feeling like it hasn't hit the mainstream yet. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great point with, with the monetization is there is, you know, with YouTube, there's an obvious monetization through AdSense and yep. with, the, yep. with the ads and whatnot. And with podcasts, you very much have to do it on your own. You know, if, if you want to make money off your podcast, you have to create something you know, like Patreon, for example, or I think there are some, I've, I've listened to some podcasts now that have integrated ads within them that are local to me. You know, I've been listening to a podcast and suddenly there's an ad for Manitoba, Canada. And so that must be some sort of AdSense type situation going on there that I've only recently started hearing. So I think that will become more popular. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the ad model. Of course, I make money off it through YouTube doing that. But I think eventually that model is going to die off too, because people are going to get sick of commercials. And so, so, you know, 
subscription based things like Spotify does, I think will eventually take over. But like you said, yeah, there has to be a clear streamlined version uh, vision of how people and creators can make money because a lot of us did it for free for so long. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that's sort of the expectation too from the listener. I used to be able to just listen to this for free. So why do I have to pay for it now? Yeah. And I think there's going to be, there's always pushback when you put in ads into any content that people got without ads before. But I think that podcasting is a little bit more difficult to have ads on because you have it, it seems so personal, like, okay, I've got this podcast, I'm sitting here with a friend in my car, and, and there is a a strange sense of intimacy that's developed there. It's like a, a, uh, a type of intimacy. And then when a, an ad comes on, it's like, it just seems grating. It's like not supposed to be there. And I've yes. never gotten comfortable with having an ad on a podcast. Uh, whereas with YouTube, yeah, okay, there's ads all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just something that invasive of a an ad on a podcast. So I've not been able to get comfortable with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and which, of course, means if you're going to be doing a podcast, uh, if you're doing it as a marketing effort, okay, it's supporting the way you're making money. But if you're just an influencer, then you've got to figure out a way to monetize that. Because exactly can't do it for free yeah exactly and so how is it that people do make money from podcasting uh, how do you make money from podcasting well patreon is the is the biggest one obviously with like we said youtube you have the adsense that doesn't carry over into into the audio platform you're not going to have those ads so yeah patreon is probably the most streamlined and simple way for your listeners to throw you a couple dollars a month if they are enjoying the show, if, if they enjoy the content that you produce. And that gives you a little bit of control over sort of a subscription base. That's probably the best thing. The other thing that is still an ad, but not doesn't come off as much of an ad is, is having a sponsor, you know, having somebody at the beginning of the episode, letting people know who, who's, you know, if it's a brand that's supporting you in some way, or, or for me, I have a sponsorship affi uh, affiliate relationship with Custom Reptile Habitat. So it, it they don't pay me to say their name, but if people do make a purchase through my links, then I make a small commission at no extra cost to the to the person who bought anything. So, so that's a way I, I have the sort of like a housekeeping 30 seconds at the beginning of each episode where I'll plug mm -hmm. the Patreon and I'll plug Custom Reptile Habitat and then the episode runs cleanly right through. Like you said, if when, you, when you're breaking up the middle of a conversation with an ad, it seems a bit weird when you're listening to it on, just through the audio. So I, th those are probably the biggest. If you, you can, if you can find a sponsor, which can be easier said than done, and, but Patreon is probably the best. You know, if you're producing good content that people really enjoy, create a Patreon account. You'd be surprised at how many people just want to support you monetarily without having anything extra. You know, some, some people just love your podcast. So they go, yeah, I have no problem giving this person $3 a month because I want to support them. And that's probably the best thing. And that gives you a better connection with your audience as well. We'd already talked about that problem with the audio only version of the podcast is who are the audience? Well, Patreon can bring those people to you and then you can have direct conversations with them and you can message back and forth and you could create a discord channel so you can have, you know, conversations on a daily basis with your listeners. There are, there are ways to do that. And I think Patreon's a great, a great, uh, highway to do that for you. All right. So you have a podcast and you have a video and it takes effort to produce both of those. What is the benefit that you derive from both of those platforms that justify the effort to maintain both of them? Th that was a question I was asking myself very early on, especially with the video, because at the time, early on, the video wasn't paying off in a way that it, I thought it would, and I was getting way more people listening to the audio version. So the video was so tedious, and it's just so much extra work to, to produce. Mm -hmm. But I, I continued with it, and like I said, now it's paid off. So. The benefit of keeping the video going is you have access to the YouTube algorithm. That that's that's really huge because, like we said, podcast hasn't figured that out yet. If 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 you if there's something that can put your show in front of the person that would want to listen to it, you got to take advantage of that. So th that's what's huge for YouTube. AdSense is a big plus as well. As the show becomes more popular and people start listening to it more, you're going to make some money off AdSense, and that's going to help help you help you produce the show, give you some money for your time. All of that is good. Again, that's with podcasting, with the audio version, that's a little bit harder to do. The other thing that's great with, with having the video on YouTube is just the searchability. I mean, that's another 
the algorithm aside, the search algorithm that's in YouTube is still really, really powerful. And it's the same algorithm that Google uses. Obviously, it's the same company. So that's another really good advantage. You're putting your content on a platform where people can search for it uh, with a powerful algorithm, which is which is great. And I think there's a there might be a deeper well maybe not i was gonna, i was going to say i think there might be a deeper connection when people can visually see the content but at the same time i think you still get that deep connection with audio so so that might not necessarily be the case but but those are the big ones the algorithm the searchability and adsense that justifies keeping it on youtube and then the audio side is if you i mean if you've done all the work for the video the audio is super easy you can just export your mp3 after editing the entire video in your editing software and then upload that to the repos or to the directory and it's not really that much extra work but the reason i love having the audio there is if you're in your car going for going for a, a bike ride or a run you don't want to have a video running you want to be able to put your phone in your pocket and close it and and not have to look at it and also use less data for those of you that have to you know you don't trying not to use cell data or you know, if you're not on Wi-Fi or whatever, you want to be able to play something with a small amount of data. You know, a podcast episode might be 90 megabytes or something, no nothing more than that. So, so that's a great justification for keeping the audio side. But really, once you've done all the work for the video, the audio is pretty simple. Do you think that your audio side is bringing you anything that the video side is not? I and, suspect... And by the way, this challenge is more of a... Uh, it, to be thorough and to be, uh, let's get thinking. Me personally, I love podcasts so much that uh, I, I, I would not, I, I, it would kill me to uh, stop my podcast and just do video. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more of a, well, let's think about this. Are we benefiting from having that audio? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I think yes. I think it goes back to what audience we're drawing in from the po with the podcast. If you have someone who actually finds your podcast on a podcasting platform, that's somebody who knows how to listen to the podcast. They probably have an app that they use. So they're very familiar with navigating through that somewhat confusing space the way it is right now. And if you get that individual to find your show, you have somebody that's a lifelong listener if, if they like it. You know, they, they got to get to the show and then enjoy the first episode they listen to. But if, if they do all those steps and enjoy it, you're, you have someone that's not only going to listen to probably almost every episode, but also going to listen to from start to finish, which certainly doesn't happen on YouTube. YouTube is, you know, very more sporadic. You know, you're going to have people that are watching it for a few minutes at a time. But the podcast listener is somebody who's dedicated to listening to, you know, they're opening their app to listen to something for an hour, an hour and a half. Right. They're not just going on to YouTube because they have three seconds to kill waiting for their mm -hmm. dentist appointment and then see a 90 minute episode and go, oh, maybe I'll watch that later. If you're opening your podcasting app, you're about to go for a drive to work or a drive to the lake yeah. or whatever it is. And those are the people that are going to be obsessed with your show. So I think you're going to get a higher value listener and an audience member from the podcast. I agree. Yeah, 100 percent. That, that's what I find is my podcasting audience is a much deeper uh, audience a much deeper fan and uh, so it's a valuable uh, tool for us uh, as content creators mm -hmm. uh, what is what does it take to start a podcast versus starting a YouTube well I think for a podcast you need the first thing is you need to figure out what you're going to talk about <laughs> you know I, I think many people and, and it sounds sort of silly to say that but many people start a podcast without really having a good, clear direction of where they want to go with it. So it, it's really important that you know exactly what you want your show to be about. And, and you can have a pretty narrow niche, and you'll, you'll be amazed at how much you can talk about in, in that one niche. Mm -hmm. But have a concept that you want to go after. That's really important. And, th and then the, the question, then it's just a question of you know equipment, getting the right equipment and microphones, finding recording software, and then figuring out a place where you're going to host the podcast. And there, there's plenty of different, I'm not sure where you host your podcast, but I host mine on a, a program called Libsyn. And there are many, many different ones. I think there's Buzzsprout. There's, there's, there's several. And, and you can look yeah. on, on YouTube. You'll find tons of tutorials about how to actually upload and, and get the podcast, the, the file up there and out to the other apps. That stuff is more is relatively easy. It's it's the actual conversation and, and what you're planning on doing is is really important. So are you going to have guests on the show? W again, what what's the theme going to be? 
for me, audio quality needs to be quite high. It, it, you, you should try to strive for having good equipment and, and, and find a quiet place to record and make sure that you're doing your best to make sure that doesn't sound like you're recording in the middle of a busy highway. Mm-hmm. You, know? you, you touched on something that I, I think is valuable to go into when we're starting off, whether it's a podcast or a YouTube channel, is figuring out what you're talking about. And you, you mentioned a niche. And we, we've heard the term niching down. Uh, so let's explore if, uh, if I'm interested. I'm new and I want to put together a show, whether a podcast or YouTube, and I love reptiles. What are the advantages and disadvantages of having a show on animals, reptiles, pets, chameleons, uh, and the different, different levels of focus? My podcast is called Animals at Home because I thought I would run out of reptile-related things to Mm -hmm. talk about. So my my YouTube channel started out, I always called it Animals at Home, but it was all reptile-focused because that's the only animals that I kept, and that's really where my passion was. But I was too scared to call it Reptiles at Home or, you know, something reptile-related. And so this is a lesson for everybody is that I've recorded 135 episodes, Mm -hmm. and except for maybe three or maybe five of those episodes have been not related to reptiles, but other than that, all of the rest of them have been completely reptile related, and I have a giant list on my desk of other people and people that I want to talk to and topics that I want to get to. So I don't think there's really any danger in niching down. There's a massive danger in being too broad. You know, I I Mm -hmm. once did this podcast, it was like a sort of like a round table where you had people from a bunch of different podcasters from a bunch of different places, you know, not just reptile themed who were talking to, I think it was some kind of expert. I forget. It was one of those zoom things that happened during the pandemic. And I just, it was like a seminar and they were kind of going around the table asking people what their podcast is about. And I still remember this one guy, he's like, my podcast is about anything and everything. (laughs) (laughs) And the, the moderator was just like, you got to change that. That is just, you cannot have a podcast about anything and everything. You'll never find your listenership because it's just too broad. So niching down to something that is quite specific is the best bet to find a really good quality, high quality audience. And even if you feel like, you know, you have an entire podcast that's based off of chameleons, like you've niched down from, from animals to reptiles down to, you know, a group of species and you said you're on season seven, you know, it's going to be a, forever you'll have enough content forever it's sort of an everlasting thing because you can constantly revisit concepts and and as science evolves there's always going to be more to get into but you're going to find people who only care about chameleons and they're going to love your content and so that 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 would be my advice you know a small fraction of a huge number is still a lot of people so if you have a a concept that seems quite niche i would still go after it well let's let's go into the difficulty uh like you talk about reptiles that is a huge topic. I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing because, uh, you know, people on the outside think, okay, reptiles, that's, that's a pretty, pretty defined niche there. But we in the reptile uh, community, we know ball python community is totally different than the chameleon community, which is totally different than the dart frog community. And then there's the iguana community, bearded dragons. Oh, and don't get me started on the geckos. And, and so, yes, there's overlap because we all have interests that overlap, but essentially... Those are all different communities. Uh, how do you, as a reptile, general reptile podcast, uh, approach and, uh, and bring in uh, all these communities? It, that is a challenge. And sometimes I find myself sort of feeling lost in a way. You know, what's my next episode going to be about? How do these, all these episodes tie together? But I come back to the concept of my podcast, which is promoting proper husbandry and ethical husbandry and, and trying to make sure that we're constantly pushing the hobby forward so in many ways my podcast becomes much more about the keeper than the reptiles themselves so the niche i've you know i've niched down to the actual keeper themselves rather than you know the actual species that we're keeping are on the periphery they're they, they're vehicles for us to have conversation about husbandry. So we never really get deep into specifics on a species because we're getting more deep into how can I do this better? How can I have a better lighting setup? How can I have the, the this enclosure built better? What what information can I extract from natural habitats that I can bring into my into my reptile room? So that is sort of I've whittled it down over the years to figuring out that okay this podcast is a place where people can go to and they're going to be able to at least every episode have a few things that they can bring to their room that are actionable things that they're able to to do to make the lives of their animals better and so that sort of 
brings out uh, sort of whittles down the chaos of all reptile species into mm-hmm. you know this is what we're doing ethical husbandry how can we do it yeah and i think that's why you've been so successful is because you don't your podcast is not about the reptiles it's not about iguanas versus geckos it's about the reptile keeper and how we should approach keeping reptiles and that's the common thread uh, among us all uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're all reptile keepers and so i i think that was just a a, a very good uh, approach um, so say we have some people out there that are trying to decide whether they should do a podcast whether they should do a youtube channel or well do both uh, what would you advise to help them make that decision? I guess it really depends on why you want to do it. So again, it comes back to the question of what, if you're trying to produce content, is do you have a goal in mind? Now, if I would say if you are somebody that's going to create a podcast, I, I would personally say you should also have it on YouTube. Even if you don't post video, you can host, you can't just host audio on, on, on YouTube, but you could post a video of just a still image or mm-hmm. your, you know, the, your album art or whatever it is, just so it's on there. So in the off chance that YouTube picks it up or that people, somebody searches for it, you're still having that access. So I would say for anybody that wants to start a podcast, you should also post it on YouTube just so you have access to that. But then the question is, what medium do you go to? Do you go towards a longer form content or do you go towards something that's, you know, shorter, kind of more fast paced, like a YouTube video? I, I think it's a what are you trying to promote and what message are you trying to get across? But I think even more so it probably comes down to your individual personality. And for me personally, I'm not somebody that wants to be waving a camera around and and trying to, you know, quickly go through my reptile room and, and you know, I'm not a low energy person, but I'm not a very eccentric, you know, extroverted person that wants to be kind of, you know, super excited on camera. And so that's why for me, I just gravitate so much more towards podcasting because it's more mellow and relaxed and I have time to, you know, flesh out an idea and and talk to somebody. And I I have friends who are amazing video creators and content creators and they're very good at making videos fast paced and they're high energy and excited and they make people want to continue watching. And, and I think that is the key. So you have to ask yourself, where do you kind of sit? Are you somebody that likes to listen to podcasts and sit down and relax? Or are you somebody that wants to have fast paced, different images flashing on the screen. If you are one of those things, then you, I would just pick, pick one of those avenues and then you could figure out what to do with it. And then once we've started it, what does it take to maintain a show long-term? That is the key. You have to maintain it long-term. And so, so what does it take? It, it takes, like I said earlier, ignoring the analytics, you have to, that's in my opinion, you have to ignore the analytics at the beginning. You have to, you have to create a show and just assume that you have 10,000 people listening to it, you know, or watching it, whatever it is. Even if you get 10 people, you have to create a show that as if you have that many people. I remember years ago, I, I was friends or I am friends with a musician and he was in the, the faculty of jazz at the university here. And I remember just hanging out with all these musicians. And I remember one musician telling me, he's like, Dylan, I can't tell you how many times I've played in front of a completely empty room because, you know, you get booked for a show, you show up and there's nobody there and you just play. And that I, that never left me. And I thought it was just such a profound thing to think about. It's like all these musicians show up on stage. There's nobody in the room and they run through their whole set as if somebody's there. That's the mentality you need to have. And they could have packed up and gone home, but why didn't they? They, they, they sit and they play together because it's practice and they're going to get better and they're going to learn from each other. And every time they play, they're going to get better. And that's the mentality you need when you're going to create something. You're not going to have a million followers in, in a month. You're not going to have 10,000 people watch your first video. You might be lucky if you have 50 people watch your first video and, and 20 people download your podcast. But every time you do it, you're going to get better and better. So you just have to ignore the analytics, assume that you're playing to a huge audience, and just consistently produce good quality content. And it will pay off. It will 100% pay off. You might not know how it's going to pay off. It might pay off in, you know, in the weirdest way. Who knows? I can't think there's a million different ways doing something good quality can pay off, but it will pay off and you just have to continue staying on the road. Dylan, thank you very much for that insight. And I invite everybody to uh, consider making a show. And uh, Dylan, I want to say thank you very much. And uh, we will see you around. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. And as I've always said, there's always more room for more content. 
if we, we need more higher quality content out there. So if you're afraid of doing it, just jump in with both feet, get it done, make it consistent, and it will pay off.